Good morning, everyone. So last day we started looking at Ka and Kb calculations, uh, specifically for weak acids and weak bases which end up in equilibrium. They don't dissociate 100%. Uh, we saw how we can utilize our ice tables to actually uh, calculate uh, the unknown uh, equilibrium constants or actually use those constants to actually figure out the pH of the resulting solution. Uh, hopefully you got some practice uh, from that yesterday. Um, Notice that we are only focusing mainly on the weak acids and weak bases because if you contrast that with something that's strong, something that ionizes 100%, something that's one-way arrow, basically for a strong case, all the reactants would have uh, completely dissociated to become products if you try to do a Kc and equilibrium constant for that uh, strong reaction, you're going to essentially have a constant that's very large uh, approaching infinity or very small approaching zero. So I'm just going to give you a quick practice question there and uh, just see how we do with this ice table. So for a warm up, I want you to find for me, determine, determine the KB of an unknown base if a 0 0.50 uh, mole per decimeter cube solution, so that's assuming before anything is ionized, uh, if that solution has a POH of 4.72, okay? So I encourage you just to pause the video. You can try it out for yourself. When you unpause, you can uh, check your work with me here. So what we have here is we have an unknown base. I'm just going to track that as a B minus, right? B is just some placeholder. I'm doing the minus because I know as a bronsteloid base, it's supposed to be uh, gaining a proton. Upon gaining a proton here, it is a sort of calculating KB question, so I'm going to uh, note that it's a weak base calculation. We're going to end up going up by an H, going up by a charge, so then one proton has been gained, HB. That, again, is a simplified equation. That one just tells you the basic, yeah, I grab a proton. Well, who does it actually steal this proton from? Before we actually get to do our ice table, I want you to always switch the simple equation to the complex equation. On the base side, how do you switch it to the complex? Remember, it's sort of like adding hydroxide on both sides. That allows you to write here, in fact, the B minus, it is going to gain a proton, but it actually gains a proton from water. It steals that proton. It's going to end up forming HB like normal, and it's actually the water that's actually going to leave behind the base, the characteristic base particle that we need. Again, because there's some sense of time passing here, so we need to go initial change in equilibrium down the side here. As mentioned before, this 0 0.50, this is the initial. This is before anything has occurred. This tells me something about the base, 0.50. Initially, nothing is ionized yet. There's no conjugate acid and there's no hydroxide. What we're going to do here is we're going to then track the change. If I didn't know anything for the equilibrium line, I would use minus x. I need to deal with my assumption. This time, what they give you is they actually give you, at the end of the day, I stick a pOH meter into the solution, and the pOH is actually 4.72. Uh, you can just think about that for a little while here. pOH here is the negative log of OH. Uh, if this number here is less than 7, this one here actually tells me my solution is basic. So how can I link this back to our ice table? Well, on my ice table, I have pulled out a hydroxide term. So let's just go from pOH here. It's easy enough just to take the anti-log of this. So anti-log of negative 4.72, or 10 to the power negative 4.72. Uh, you can type that in at any given point. So 10 to the power negative 4.72 uh, gives us here 1.9 times 10 to the negative 5. Right, so that's what that 10 to the power stands for. Careful when you're using your exponent button here. Don't type this in as 10e, negative 4.72. You'll be off by a power of 10. You can type it in as 1 times 10 to the negative 4.72. You can say 1e, negative 4.72. Or better yet, just go 10 hat, negative 4.72. I'm actually going to leave it written as an exponent, just so that you get some familiarity with it. They actually tell me that at equilibrium, the hydroxide amount is enough to be 10 to the negative 4.72. This 1.9 times 10 to the negative 5 number. Well, because I know one of these values at equilibrium, I now know this is gained by 10 to the power of negative uh, 4.72. This one here is also gained, also a product, 10 to the power of 4.72. That's a 1 to 1 ratio. And the other side here has to be dropped by that same 10 to the power of negative 4.72. Right? Uh, I'm going to just type that uh, left-hand side in, 0.5 minus uh, this answer here. This gives me here 0 0.49998. Right? So practically, it's uh, as if... If I imagine I had 0 0.50, I had a box full of B minus, there's so little that actually breaks off this 10 to the negative 5 number that practically it's still 0.5. Uh, at this point here, we have all the numbers in the equilibrium line, so we're ready to do the equilibrium constant expression. 
Kb is going to be the conjugate acid HB, uh, multiplied by the hydroxide, divided by the B minus. Uh, we just basically punch our way through then to calculate the Kb. It's basically a 10, haha, uh, base, uh, negative uh, 10 to the power negative 4.72, 10 to the power negative 4.72, divided by this 0 0.49998 number. And we're going to get a Kb value. So let's type this in. Divided by 0.49998 gives me here a Kb constant of 7.3 times 10 to the negative 10. This is an equilibrium constant. I know it's small, so I know reactants are favored. That uh, jives well with, yep, I have a lot of reactants at equilibrium. Um, this number probably doesn't mean much. Uh, usually when we compare it to the table, the table has it expressed as pKb. So let's just try it out here. pKb, p of anything, power of anything is negative log of that number. If I take the negative log of this Kb that I just found, 7.3 times 10 to the negative 10, uh, this pKb is actually uh, 9.14, give or take. This one here is an intensive quantity. So this right here um, tells you something about the chemical. We actually have a base that matches this on the table. On table uh, 21, I believe this is. On table 21, which gives you strengths of acids and bases, something that has a pKb of 9.14 is actually the compound phenylamine. And phenylamine has this formula here, C6H5 and H2. We'll see a little bit more with that compound in our organic chapter. But there we go uh, through a sort of ice table sort of problem. We didn't need to do an assumption because I knew what the change line was. I was actually able to identify what this chemical is supposed to be. Uh, today, we're going to switch gears a little bit here. We're going to still be dealing with uh, equilibria, so weak acids and weak bases, but we're going to specifically be looking at a lens of a buffer. Just let me give you a general idea of buffer before we step our way through the notes here. For a chemical buffer, uh, again, I already alluded to we are going to be using something that's weak because I need something that's in equilibrium. Let's take ethanoic acid, so chiku. Right? Remember, anytime you're given a chemical, ask yourself, what is this? Is it an acid-based salt? Well, it's an acid. It has a Ka value, so it's a weak acid. I'm just going to do the simplified equation just for argument's sake here. This weak acid here, a little bit of it manages to break off. We get H plus and CH3CO minus. But if you check the Ka, it's very tiny. In terms of this sort of box picture here, there's actually very little that actually manages to break off. That's why we needed those ice table calculations to figure out how much H plus and acetate that I would have. A buffer is a solution. Actually, I can write this uh, definition down since we have it uh, down here. A buffer is a solution that contains appreciable amounts. There is a good amount, appreciable amounts of weak acid and conjugate base or uh, weak base and conjugate acid, so two types of buffers there. Uh, and what is their job? This buffer system here, when I have these appreciable amounts, when I have good amounts of the conjugates, its job is to resist. Uh, they resist, here's an emphasis here, large changes of pH. So it doesn't let the pH jump all of a sudden either way. Uh, upon small additions of acid and base. Okay. So that is a definition that they're interested in, that you need to know here. Uh, essentially, we use this uh, word in English here. Oh, if I create a buffer for myself, I give myself a little bit of room, a little bit of leeway on either side. What the leeway is in this case here is I want to have a little bit of leeway so I have a little bit of acid or a little bit of base here. It, I don't want the pH to suddenly jump overly low for an acid or overly high for a base. The reason why we need something that's weak, so you see that uh, similarity in both styles of buffers here, is because we need to use this equilibrium. We need to uh, let this equilibrium actually shift left or shift right. In fact, right now, this weak acid just by itself, right? that's sort of this first component, this weak acid is sort of half a buffer. This one here can buffer uh, small additions of base. Well, why is that? Let's say I add a small amount of hydroxide, right? So I have a little bit of base in the system here. The base is going to react with the H+. This is going to neutralize. This is going to end up forming water. 
as it pertains to this equilibrium initially, it's going to pull down the H+, plus, very similar to that common ion effect, and it's going to shift to the right. Well, I had a lot of acetic acid, you had lost H+, plus. I'm going to try to counteract you, I'm going to try to replenish some of the H+, plus. I know it's not going to get back up to uh, what it was completely. But the goal here is, well, I had enough acetic acid, I can buffer small amounts of base, I'm not going to let the pH jump all of a sudden. At this point here, I cannot buffer acid. If I add an acidic solution, if this concentration goes way up, again, Le Chatelier would respond. Le Chatelier says, well, I want to shift away from this. I want to use up some of the H+. I want to shift to the left. Yes, I definitely have a lot of H+. I just added it. But you'll notice, because there was just a smidgen of acid that was actually created, by the time the acid gets used up, I have no more acid to shift left. The reverse reaction cuts off. Then any excess H+, just sits around, and now the pH has suddenly dropped downwards. So to be a buffer, it needs to be able to buffer both acid and base. Later on, I'm going to use the terminology, what's an acidic buffer or basic buffer? That actually refers to something else. As a buffer in general, you have to be able to control both. Control additions of base, control additions of acid. So we saw what was limiting me as a buffer. Why, why aren't I buffer in this case here is because I ran out of acetate. What I'm going to do artificially is I'm going to come in and I'm going to beef up the conjugate base. The weak acid just purely doesn't give enough acid to begin with. Let's add to this mixture, let's add a salt, sodium acetate. Well, where did that sodium come from? Remember, alkali salts are always soluble. I don't really care about the sodium. Sodium is going to be a site heater. At least this sodium uh, acetate is going to dissociate and it's going to beef up this acetate number for me. In fact, when you first do that, you, when you increase this one here, you will already be shifting this equilibrium. We're going to just ignore that for a little while. Basically, at the end of the day, I'm going to have appreciable amounts, good amounts of both. Uh, appreciable just means um, it doesn't necessarily have to be equal, but relatively the same on both sides. So for example, if I had one molar weak acid, at first, because the Ka constant was so tiny, I would only have maybe like 0, 0.0, I'm making up a number here, 0 0.01 molar acetate. But what I'm going to do artificially is I'm going to come in, let's add one molar of your salt. The salt contains your conjugate. Let's beef up this number here to close to one molar as well. Again, it doesn't have to be identical on both sides. That's actually when the buffer is working at the maximum capacity here. But I need to have good amounts of both so that if you increase H+, plus, it is an equilibrium after all, it is going to shift left. And now that I've beefed up the amount of conjugate, phew, I have enough conjugate to actually uh, shift over. I can sort of get rid of some of the excess H+, plus, not completely, uh, but I can maintain the pH within a very small addition of uh, H+, plus and OH-. minus. Okay, So that's actually the buffer system that they did here. A buffer can be created. There's actually two ways of making a buffer. This is the easier way. A buffer can be created by mixing. This one here, ask yourself, what is it? Well, we already said this one here is a weak acid. We're going to beef up the conjugate. The conjugate of my acetic acid is acetate, so I'm going to add in a salt-containing the acetate, and therefore, I'm going to have this expression again, CH3COH in equilibrium, H+. Plus. At first, again, my weak acid, most of it stays on this side. I dissolved in one mole into one liter, so that is my one mole of concentration. At first, the acetate wasn't very high. I'm going to add in the conjugate as a separate step. That conjugate is also added one mole in the liter. This one here is now going to be one molar. This is what I call appreciable amounts. I have good amounts of both. Uh, the H plus is still going to be something um, uh, just tiny because the H plus would have just been, uh, remember the weak acid here? The weak acid produces, let's say, 0 0.01 H plus, 0 0.01 H plus. Sure, upon adding the acetate at first, it's going to shift a little bit here, but this H plus here starts off being very tiny. Okay? So uh, it's important for you here. Uh, we can actually do this buffer system here, something that's weak, and you artificially beef up the conjugate. Because it's a weak system, I can define the equilibrium constant. So let's define the Ka for my acetic acid. My Ka is going to be H plus times acetate divided by acetic acid. Right. I can look up the Ka as a pKa on table 21. Uh, what we have here is a very special point on the buffer that because... I said appreciable amount just means they have to be roughly the same. If it was like 0.9 molar and this one here is 1.1 molar, still a buffer. But in this situation, whenever these two concentrations are equal, we are at a very special point. So here's an important note. Whenever the concentration of your acid form happens to equal the 
conjugate concentration, so acetic acid is equal to conjugate, what's going to happen upon that assumption, um, basically I'm going to have this one here cancel this one, and therefore I have a slightly simplified mixture. So this is uh, when those concentrations are equal, so not all the time, but when those concentrations are equal, the Ka actually equals to the H+, plus. I can actually find how acidic my solution is directly based on how strong the acid is. Uh, better yet, uh, the Ka might have a 10 to the negative something. Let's go negative log of Ka. The pKa will actually equal the pH of the buffer at that system. So uh, let's make that note there. Whenever the concentration HA is actually equal to A minus, I just saw that those two terms cancel out. Uh, the pH of the buffer is equal to the pKa. Now let me just uh, emphasize what's the significance of that there. Every chemical will have a certain Ka, right? Chemically speaking, depending on the bonds, depending on how good it is in ionizing in water, everything will have a unique Ka. When I'm trying to maintain the pH, uh, let's say blood for example, uh, blood is supposed to be optimum pH is a pH of give or take 7.3 or so. If I want to have a buffer that buffers at this pH, I need to find a chemical that has a pKa around 7.3. As a buffer, I know in general, you can add acid, you can add base, it keeps the pH relatively constant, but I need a chemical that is already roughly 7.3. I can have other buffers, maybe it's a pKa of 1, where it's going to buffer around 1, it doesn't let the pH change uh, up or down from that pH of 1, that's not going to be useful for blood. And in fact, it's actually pretty stringent here, it can be very dangerous for our bodies if our pH gets upwards of, let's say, 7.5 or so, probably doesn't even need to get to that, then the blood is a little bit too basic for our liking. We're going to get a situation called alkalosis. Our blood is a little bit too basic. Uh, that's going to actually interfere with uh, how oxygen gets carried more on this later on. That can be deadly for us. Or if the pH drops below, let's say, 7.2 or so, we're going to get a condition called acidosis. You notice that this one here doesn't give me a very wide range. I need to make sure that there's buffer systems in my body to make sure my blood is uh, maintained at a, a relatively constant 7.3 or so. Okay? Um, if you take a look at some of the foods that we eat here, like lemon juice or uh, vinegar or Coke, these ones here are very, very acidic. There's going to be pH 2, pH 3, pH 4, something like that. Well, next time you drink Coke, right, it doesn't suddenly make your blood overly acidic. It's fortunate for us, yes, the Coke itself is very acidic. Let's say in that sense there, you ingest a bunch of acid. This one here goes way up, but luckily we have, acid, uh, we have buffers in our blood that can actually navigate some of this H+. We can shift the equilibrium over. It won't be acidic acid, but it's going to shift the equilibrium uh, over. In this case, you're increasing H+, actually shifts it to the left. Fortunately, because I have enough of the conjugate, I can remove a lot of that I added. It's not going to keep the pH exactly constant, although we're going to use that as a simplification tomorrow, uh, but basically it keeps the pH of a moderate range. So let me just draw a quick uh, picture of what, the, what happens here. Uh, so let's say I have a buffer system. Let's say the buffer's in our blood. It's supposed to be pH of 7.3. What I'm plotting here is pH on the vertical axis here. I'm going to plot volume of, uh, let's say, uh, base added. So I'm just going to come along. My experiment is just I'm going to uh, artificially come in and add more base. So as I head to the right, I'm actually adding more and more base. When you add base, I would expect the pH to increase because it means more basic. Without a buffer, as you add base, doesn't matter strong base, weak base, doesn't need to be even that high concentrations, this pH here would suddenly shoot up like that. That could be very dangerous for our blood. Because we have buffers in our blood here, Although you are increasing the amount of OH minus, right, you're having more and more base, the pH here just steadily climbs. It is going to increase, but it doesn't increase nearly as quick. Now, there is a limit to my buffering uh, capacity. right? As you add a uh, base particle here, we kill off the H+. Plus. I want to keep shifting right. If I run out of acetic acid, there's no more shifting that's going to be involved. It is going to eventually jump up later on. But that's outside of the buffer system. If I add acid instead, or if I sort of remove some of the base that I did, if I add H+, plus, adding H+, plus wants it to shift left, that's going to rely on how much acid I have because I had artificially beefed up that number. This concentration here will also try to moderate the amount of H+, plus to some extent here before it suddenly jumps. Okay. So buffers here will eventually run out, but there is going to be a buffering region where the pH, let's write this in words here, 
the pH remains uh, fairly uh, constant, not exactly the same, that's important. It remains fairly constant upon small additions of acid or base. To be a buffer, you need to be able to um, give yourself leeway in, on both sides. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as a buffering capacity. So depending on the actual concentrations, how long can I buffer for, what amounts do I have to actually shift left or shift right, that's called a buffer capacity. More on that uh, in upcoming lessons. So buffer capacity. Okay. So without the buffer, it would shoot up and shoot down way quicker. I just want to show you in this case here, the pH is not constant. Even though I said my optimum pH is 7.3, even with the buffer, it might go 7.31, 7.32. It is going to change. It is fairly constant, but note that there are, is going to still be a small change. Uh, upon small addition of acid and bases, why this other criteria? Why just small addition of acid and bases? If you add too much, I'm assuming that you're going to be too far out of this buffering range here, and you basically overshot this buffer here, and now the pH is going to suddenly jump. Okay? So, okay, who cares? Why would I make this buffer in the first place? Why is it important? Again, buffers are designed to minimize, I prefer this language here, to minimize the pH change. It is going to change. Shifting is not perfect. Lichitelli says it tries to counteract you. It never gets it back down to what it was to minimize the pH change, uh, again, upon small additions of acids or bases. And I want to keep emphasizing this as a buffer, you need to be able to leeway on both sides. Okay. So I want you to consider what happens. What would happen if 9 liter of water was added to 1 liter of 0 0.100 molar uh, HCl? So let's start off. My initial solution is 0 0.10 uh, molar HCl. I can calculate my pH. I call this pH initial. Negative log of 0 0.100. My initial pH is a pH of 1. Right. Again, for P anything, the significant digits are after the decimal place. So very, it's a strong acid, no surprise, I'm less than 7 here. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to take 1 liter of this HCl solution. So currently we were 0 0.100 molar. My volume was just, 10, uh, was just 1 liter. I'm now going to add an extra 9 liter. So I'm adding a difference of 9 so that my final volume, so 9 liters added, so that my final volume is now 10 liters. So what's happened here is, well, I've diluted the acid. Let's go C1, V1, C2, V2, anytime I do a dilution here. My starting concentration used to be 0 0.100. My starting volume used to be 1 liter. What's my new concentration now that my final volume, the 1 plus the 9, is actually 10 liters? It shouldn't be that hard to see here. We just have factor by factor of uh, 10. So our new concentration is actually going to be 0 0.0100 molar. And likewise, this is HCl. If I did the pH, my new pH or my pH afterwards, if I tried to do a negative log of 0 0.0100, that would actually give you a pH of 2. Right? I told you our blood is, it can only vary kind of at the first decimal place here. If I change by one whole pH unit just by adding a little bit of water, that's going to be very deadly for us. Right? What we're going to do now is we're actually going to study if this were actually a buffer system, if it wasn't a strong acid, if we had things that can actually maintain these large changes in pH, let's figure out uh, what actually happens. So let's add uh, the same 9 liters, but this time let's add it to our buffer system, which had 1 molar of this, 1 molar of this. Same thing would happen going 1 into 10. The concentration, let me just write it down for you here, our acetic acid and our H+, plus. I'm just adding water, so I'm not trying to shift the equilibrium, but by adding sort of 10 times the volume, my concentration has dropped. So now I have 0 0.1 molar. Now I have 0 0.1 molar. What has happened to my buffer system? Well, let's try it out here. Uh, I'm going to have the K8, again, as the H plus times the CH3COO um, times it by the acetic acid. Earlier, we had said if it was 1 molar, 1 molar, hey, they cancel out. Now what we have is we have a situation where well, this one here is 0 0.1 molar, this one here is 0 0.1 molar. They still happen to be equal to each other, coincidentally. These ones here cancel out. My Ka is still going to be the H+. That's actually what we had from earlier. Earlier, Ka was equal to H+. So therefore, the pH, or pKa, is still equal to the pH. There's actually, there was no change on the pH. So as you see, 
diluting a buffer, diluting buffer has no change. That's not exactly true, okay, but just based on our hand moving math here, has no change on pH. But at least for us here, the pH at initially in my one molar solution, the pH was just going to be the pKa. Uh, let's say it was actually 7.3, that's the um, buffering system for blood. Um, later on, after you dilute it, those ones still canceled out here. That one there is still going to be 7.3. It's like the pH hasn't changed. So diluting without a buffer, there was one whole unit of change here. That's a tremendous change, right? Remember, it's a logarithmic scale. This one here is a big jump. It's one unit on the pH scale. And yet, for my buffer system, it's somehow, because of the shifting, because of the equilibrium, it's somehow able to moderate that change. What does change, again, it's not perfect. 7.3 might drop to, I don't know, 7.29 or something, but relatively is constant. What does change here, not immediately obvious, is this, we actually lose some buffer capacity. So even though it looks like my pH hasn't changed, it's 7.3 is 7.3, remember we really needed these actual amounts. I needed the one molar, I needed the one molar to be shifting. So let's say I add, suddenly I add one molar H plus. Well, I'm going to want to shift left. Well, good. I have a lot of one molar of this. I can shift to the left. I can force my acetate run to H plus with good energy, good geometry, and that can moderate some of this addition here. Again, it doesn't bring it back down completely. I'm thinking here, if I look at the H plus plot versus time, I may have suddenly increased it. By shifting to the left, it's going to bring the concentration back down a little bit, <coughs> so it's not identical, but at least it doesn't let the H plus suddenly jump to those really, really high extremes, and the pH will be really low. Now what I have is a solution where I have only 0.1 and 0.1. So if I added that same one molar H+, plus, that's my stress, right? The next time I drink a can of pop or something, right? Very, very acidic. Uh, I want to shift left, but I don't have nearly as much uh, acetate. I have a smaller container, smaller container acetic acid. I can shift left to a certain degree, but not as much as I could before. So in that case there, lose buffer capacity, um, the amounts of conjugates run out quicker. So it's not that I can't buffer, but I can't buffer for that long. I can still buffer, I can still keep the pH here within a very narrow range, within a very tiny addition to acid base, but once I lose uh, all those amounts here, the jumps are going to happen a lot quicker. So this one's going to jump up, this one's going to jump down. Still, I'm able to buffer at 7.3, but I can't buffer for as long. So run out quicker, so therefore it doesn't take as much for the pH to suddenly jump up or jump down. Okay, So uh, just some other terminology just to uh, finish off with this first way of making a buffer. Wait a minute. If we just need this equilibrium system, aren't all weak acid buffers? Right? Why did we need to actually beef up the conjugate? Here, I'm going to do it in general here. So we have 0.1 molar HF. We have just HF as a chemical. Because this one here is a weak acid, we know that the constant is very tiny. The amount of H plus that they break off and the F minus that they have is actually really, really tiny. You can do your Ka calculations. I'd encourage you to actually practice that. Figure out for me how much H plus you have at this point here. This one, definitely, we don't have appreciable amounts. Which way can we buffer at this point? Again, it can very, uh, very weakly buffer. It can buffer small additions of base. That's because, we did this earlier, if you add base, the base is going to react with the H+, plus. that's going to neutralize out the H+, plus. that's going to form water, it's going to pull the equilibrium, uh, the H+, plus concentration down, it's going to try to shift right. No problem. Our weak acid equilibrium can shift right, given we have our appreciative amounts, I have good amounts, right? even the weak acid, I already have good amounts of HF, no problem. As long as I still have HF, I can shift right. I can replenish some of the H plus that disappears. What's the problem here is a buffer, again, needs to be able to buffer both acid and base. I already showed you earlier here. Let's see if you can work with the logic here. What if I add small amounts of H plus instead? Well, you add H plus, right? Equilibrium wants to shift to the left. And again, while we only had a small smidgen of F minus that we have, that's going to run out very quickly. The equilibrium currently cannot shift left since the concentration of F minus, the concentration of the conjugate base, is small. There was not a lot of it from just the weak acid ionizing. 
So how do we guarantee that this is going to be a buffer? I'm going to artificially beef up the F minus. Let's add in a salt. Let's add in NaF. Where did the Na come from? Well, it's an alkali salt. I know it completely breaks up. This is going to artificially beef up the F minus and deal with this problem here. Well, the F minus previously was small, but now if I beef up this amount, again, they don't have to be identical, but as long as I have good amounts of both, whether you add acid or whether you add base, I can shift left or shift right. So again, the conclusion out of there here is I want you to make sure you know buffers must control both acids and bases. So whether you add acid, it keeps the pH from dropping too much. Whether you add bases, it doesn't, keep, uh, it doesn't let the pH increase by that much. And now what we're going to do is we're going to introduce, well, what is an acidic buffer and a basic buffer? Well, the word buffer already means I need to give you leeway on both sides. What the acidic and basic part actually emphasize now, the acidic part actually tells you this actually buffers in the acidic region. It doesn't just buffer acids. All buffers need to buffer both acids and bases, but if you look at the constant, if you look at where, uh, at what pH does it actually buffer, so uh, we'll just use 7 as our dividing line, I'm going to assume we're at 25 degrees, I'm going to have some buffers that end up working in the pH, let's say pH 3, pH 2, right? I can buffer pH, I'm buffering additions of base, I'm not letting the pH climb by that much, buffer acids, I'm not letting uh, the acids drop by that much, that would be called an acidic buffer. Usually for an acidic buffer, it would need to be a combination weak acid conjugate base because weak acids typically have pKa's that are less than 7, right? Remember the pH was equal to pKa whenever uh, the conjugate amounts were the same. Well, what about a basic buffer then? A basic buffer, all buffers need to buffer both acids and bases. This basic buffer here buffers in the basic region. Uh, what's the basic region for us here? Is a pH bigger than 7? So I had mentioned in blood, blood was 7.3, so that would be an example of a basic buffer. But let's go more extreme. Uh, let's say I have another um, buffer here. Uh, this one here actually buffers at 10, right? That's referred to as a basic buffer. It's able to keep the base change from doing too much, the acid from changing too much, but where it actually does that is it actually does it uh, in the basic side, the basic region. So when they use that terminology, acidic or basic buffer, they're just telling you whereabouts am I actually controlling the pH. They're not saying, oh, I can only buffer base or I can only buffer acid. They also like asking you this question here, what limits the buffer's capacity? So uh, if you have limits uh, to the buffer capacity, essentially what you're looking for, we are doing with Lichitelli, we just want to figure out uh, which chemical runs out so the equilibrium can no longer shift. Okay, So let's take for example here, this is a weak acid. I beef up the conjugate base, so it's going to be an acidic buffer. My pKa, that's for my acid, my pKa is equal to the pH at that point. Uh, I can buffer both acids and bases. Let's say I end up adding OH minus. What's going to limit my ability to buffer OH minus? Again, when you add OH minus, it's supposed to be killing off H plus. As I pull down the H plus, I want to shift right. The HF is actually going to limit the, so concentration HF will actually limit the ability to buffer, to control the amount of hydroxide. It won't keep it perfectly constant. We'll do it with the math uh, tomorrow, but at least I wanted to introduce this to you. What if I added acid, or what if I removed some of that OH minus that I had put in? So let's say I add acid. Phew. First thing, I beefed up the conjugate amount. As you add acid, I want to shift left, but it's only going to do be to shift left until the F minus is gone. So therefore, it's actually the F minus. Don't memorize that. You can just read that from the equation. Uh, F minus actually limits the ability to buffer, to control the H plus. But note that all buffers need to control both acid addition and base addition. Okay? So I'll leave it off there. If you have any questions, let me know. Thanks, guys.